Section 28 of Monday Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Monday Tales by Alphonse Daudet. Translated by Marion McIntyre. Section 28. With the 300,000 francs which Girardin promised me. After a two hours walk in Paris, when you had left home with light tread and gay hearted, have you never returned out of sorts, depressed by a sadness for which you could ascribe no cause, an incomprehensible weariness? You ask yourself what ails you, but seek in vain for an answer to the question. Your walk had led you through pleasant paths. It was dry underfoot, and the sun shone brightly, and yet, your heart is touched with a pain and sorrow that linger like the memory of some past grief. For in this mighty Paris, with its multitude of people who feel themselves free and unobserved, it is impossible to take a step without jostling against some intrusive misery that bespatters the passer-by, leaving its ineffaceable mark. I am speaking not merely of those misfortunes with which we are familiar, in which we are interested, of those disappointments of some friend which seem in some slight degree our disappointments also which oppress our hearts with a pang almost of remorse when we encounter them suddenly neither do i speak of the troubles of those for whom we feel mere indifference to whom we listen with one ear only scarcely suspecting that we are distressed at all i speak of those sorrows which are quite alien to our lives of which we catch only a passing momentary glimpse while rambling about through the crowded streets. Fragments of dialogues are heard, interrupted by the noise of vehicles. Some of these wayfarers are preoccupied, deaf and dumb. They soliloquize loudly, with wild gestures. Their eyes glitter feverishly, and their shoulders droop from weariness. Others there are whose pale faces are swollen with weeping, black-veiled mourners whose recent tears are scarcely dried. And then those trivial details which seem to elude notice. That figure whose well-worn coat, shiny from frequent brushings, shuns the bright daylight. Another, seated beneath a porch, turning a barrel organ that has lost its notes. A hunchback who wears about her neck a velvet ribbon, stiffly tied between her misshapen shoulders. You sight these unfortunates, strangers to you, merely for a moment, and forget them as you pass on, but they have brushed against you. You have felt some passing contact with their wretchedness. Your very garments are impregnated with the weariness that follows in their footsteps, and at the day's end you feel a restlessness, a sense of depression, for at some street corner, at the threshold of some home, unconsciously you have touched the invisible thread that binds so closely the existence of all these wretched ones that the least shock to one is felt by all i was thinking of this the other morning for it is especially during the morning that the misery of paris may be seen at its worst i saw walking in front of me a poor lean devil in a coat much too small for him which seemed to make his long legs still longer and to exaggerate tremendously all his gestures. He was walking very fast, bent almost double, swaying like a tree tossed by the wind. From time to time he would put his hand in one of his back pockets and break off a bit of a small roll concealed there, devouring it furtively as if ashamed to eat in the street. When I see masons seated upon the sidewalks, nibbling the heart of a fine fresh loaf, it gives me an appetite. I envy, too, each humble clerk rushing back from the bake-shop to his work, pen behind his ear and his mouth full, quite exhilarated by this meal in the open air. But this man wore the shame-faced air of one who knows what real hunger means, and it was pitiful to see this unfortunate, afraid to eat more than the tiniest morsels of the bread he was crumbling within his pocket. I followed him for a moment, but suddenly, brusquely as frequently happens with these dazed beings, the trend of his thought was changed, and turning around he found himself face to face with me. Hello, is it you? 
i chanced to recognize him as an acquaintance one of those fomenters of schemes that spring up in innumerable numbers from the very pavement of paris an inventor a founder of impossible journals which for a space make no end of talk in print and are advertised on every side three months ago he had disappeared in a formidable plunge after a few days bubbling of the waters where he fell the surface of the tide was as smooth as ever the waters closed again and no one thought further about him he was disturbed at seeing me and in order to cut short all questioning and doubtless also to divert attention from his sordid appearance his half pennyworth of bread he began to talk very rapidly in a tone of assumed gaiety his affairs were progressing finely finely a little at a standstill just at present but this would not be for long at this very moment he was considering a magnificent undertaking nothing less than a great industrial journal illustrated much money in it and a splendid contract superb advertising his face grew more and more animated as he talked his figure straightened itself by degrees he began to assume a protecting tone as though he fancied himself already seated at his editor's desk he even asked me to furnish some articles adding in a triumphant voice and you know it's an assured thing i shall begin with the three hundred thousand francs that girardin has promised me girardin that is the name forever upon the tongue of all these visionaries when i hear it pronounced i seem to see new quarters huge buildings never completed journals just fresh from print with lists of subscribers and directors how often i have heard it said of some senseless project we must speak about that to girardin and in this poor devil's brain also had come the idea that he must mention his scheme to girardin all night long he had been preparing his plan figuring upon it then he had started out and as he went on to his excited fancy it had all looked so fine that at the moment of our encounter it seemed absolutely impossible to him that girardin could think of refusing that three hundred thousand francs and in stating that they had been promised to him the poor wretch told no falsehood for his words were merely the continuation of his dream while he was talking we were jostled and pushed against a wall we stood upon the sidewalk of one of those bustling streets leading to the bourse and the bank it was filled with people rushing on distractedly and absorbed in their own affairs anxious shopkeepers in haste to pay their notes petty speculators with coarse faces hurling quotations in each other's ears as they passed by and listening to all these fine projects in the midst of that crowd in that quarter where speculation runs riot where all these players of the game of chance impart their feverish haste to every one i shuddered as one might to hear the tale of some shipwreck recited in mid-ocean for i saw all that this man was telling me actually written upon the faces of those about us all his catastrophes all his radiant hopes could be read in their wild dazed eyes he left me as suddenly as he had accosted me and plunged headlong into that whirl of folly and illusions and lying hopes all that which men of this sort refer to in a serious tone as affairs at the end of five minutes i had forgotten him but at night after i had returned home when i had dispelled the memory of all the sad sights of the day in shaking the dust of the streets off my feet i seemed to see again that wan worried face of the man with his morsel of bread seemed to see the gesture that emphasized those pompous words with the three hundred thousand francs which girardin has promised me end of section twenty eight recording by linda johnson